to do that. So um, this is one of the ancillary activities I'm involved in, the PSRN. And the, the basic thinking here is that if the plant community speaks with one voice, they will be heard better in the cacophony of everybody needs money, especially the NIH. And the goal is ultimately to get more resources for you so you can do your good work. Um, now, uh, in today's uh, presentation, I'm going to go through some background, but the uh, ultimate question for today is really what does this mean for BTI? If, if, if I or any of you else are out doing national work, international work, um, how does this affect the institute? What can, what can this do for us? So I'm going to, um, going to rush through some uh, slides that, uh, on topics you've heard before, you might be familiar with, um, just to set up the background and then talk more specifically about uh, recommendations for postgraduate training, particularly stimulated by a group of postgraduates that um, we convened for a workshop last September, and uh, then I'll discuss what are we doing real here at the Institute and, and what should we be thinking about as we move forward. And especially want to put a bug in the ear of the, of the PGS and the faculty because this is your organization, this is your institute. How, how, how do you want it to work? How do you want it to prepare you uh, for your future careers? <clears throat> so these are the, this is uh, obviously the outline of the talk, so introducing the PSRN. And then the scenario of the work, which was a background for strategic planning, taking that into the training recommendations, and then asking how we are and could in the future perhaps apply some of these principles to what we do at BTI. So the PSRN is a coalition of scientific societies, 14 of them, uh, last count. Uh, we could take in others, but trying to uh, herd that many cats is already uh, a big job. So these are very diverse societies that are going from underneath the ground in the soil science is uh, over to taxonomy, to chemistry, and molecular biology, genomics, and, and even the ecological society uh, here. The ecological society is uh, the most reticent because they think that, you know, these, these historical barriers between the molecular types and the ecological types are insurmountable, and we argue, no, we're all in this together. We're all interested in how plants function in the environment uh, in, in, at different levels of dissection. So this group of, of um, Society supported by the NSF, they've put quite a lot of money into this research coordination network, uh, close to a million dollars by now, plus we've had support from, uh, from Howard Hughes Medical Institute. So um, there's a lot of interest in hearing what the plant community has to say. Uh, from NSF's perspective, they'd rather hear one voice than 10 different voices saying 10 different things so they can understand what the community wants. Remember that NSF is supposed to respond to the community, to the scientific community, and do with your tax dollars what you think they ought to do. When they hear from different advocacy groups all around the plant sciences, each arguing for a different narrow slice of science, they can't make a decision. So they give money to the, uh, the groups of scientists that come in with a limited set of asks. And so the goal of the PSRN is to come to consensus about what we should ask for in terms of support and at least bring in some new resources for those purposes. So uh, the, the PSRN came about because of the Cato Vision document, which I'm sure most of you have heard about. I hope so if you're at BTI. This was published in 2013 and had five chapters in it, which are listed here. Uh, I renamed them just to make them look simple. And the one that's circled there is Reimagine and Training. And in the, <coughs> in the process of writing the, the, the Cato Vision, um, the, the future of training turned out to be one of the most uh, it, uh, topics of the greatest interest and also perhaps controversial in some ways that people think everything's just fine right now. Usually when you ask the trainees it isn't and when you ask the faculty it's, it's, it's going very well. So there's a lot of diversity of opinion across generations. But anyway, the concept that came out of the Cable Vision was this so-called T-training idea which is that your vertical axis is very important. This is your classical research training with your mentor learning how to write, do experiments and so on. You have seminars. And then we are arguing then for a broader set of skills that most people will require in order to succeed in the, in the 21st century. Whether they're in academia, they have to do things differently than before. It's more collaborative, it's more international, it's more dynamic. And also, if you end up outside of academia, which accounts for five or uh, out of six or six out of seven PhDs in, in the life sciences, don't end up in academic positions. So we need to prepare them as well. So the PSRN came about because when the Cato Vision was written and, and we sent it out for review, and it was, I'm saying we because it was a, a large group of people, I, I happened to be leading them, but it was really an effort by the community. They said, well, what's going to happen next if you have these ideas, uh, you know, who's going to take them forward? And, and, and the NSF encouraged us to write 
a research coordination network proposal that uh, funded or continues to fund the PSRN. So the PSRN has been busy. It's an organization that has a lot of, a lot of meetings and workshops. Uh, so far, we have uh, published three documents. Um, one of them is the scenario document that was used uh, not just by us for our own workshops, but also for BTI. HHMI used it recently for it, um, a visioning on broadening participation in, in undergraduate context and, and the international programs at uh, CALS. I think CALS used the scenario document to start kick off their future planning last year. So these kind of documents and scenarios, which I'll very briefly allude to, uh, they're, they're widely applicable. They're just ways to think about the future. We also came out with cyber infrastructure recommendations. This was led by Brett Tyler, who's one of our steering committee members. Those were submitted to uh, NSF last year. They had a request for input from the community. Uh, these are also available online. I know uh, Lucas was, uh, had an eye on this, uh, among other people. There also is a, something called the National Plant Systems Initiative. This is kind of an intermediate decadal vision, so it's some big scientific goals, infrastructure goals, and training goals for the next five years. The NPSI, uh, we sent it out for comment to those 14 societies and got back hundreds and hundreds of comments, which I have waded through. They're quite interesting. They range from finally somebody saying these things, this is great, to, um, you know, you guys are completely on the wrong track. And so, um, you know, trying to, again, build that into consensus is, is always a challenge. But it, it, it should be out uh, fairly soon and, uh, again, hopefully a resource for people to think about where science, plant science might be headed and how we should prepare for it. <coughs> <clears throat> and then, of course, the training, which I'll be getting into next. So just to remind you what scenarios are, um, the way a lot of us tend to think about the future is tomorrow and today is plus and minus 10%, whether it's the stock market, um, our interest in our jobs, or anything else. We tend to project in a linear way because it's simpler to think about. But scenarios remind us that the future isn't that predictable, that it's full of uncertainties, and therefore, the future is equally uncertain. It's not plus or minus 10%. It's plus or minus one catastrophe or one miracle or whatever that can completely change how we think about the future or one election. I was our favorite example right now. So scenarios tell us that in preparing for the future, we can't prepare for the future. We have to prepare for the futures. And so that's why we built scenarios in the PSRM. And these are the four scenarios we came up with. I'm not going to go into them in much detail, except to say that in terms of plant science, we found there was two of the most important uncertainties were what kind of research environment we would have. We called it limited versus um, expansive. So what kind of resources are there going to be? Financial resources, infrastructure resources, who's going to be interested in doing science? And if it's not many people, not much resources, you're limited. If there's a lot of interest in science, it's front and center that it's expansive. And on the other uncertainty, it was really why people get up in the morning to do research. And on one limit, everybody does research. Who does research is because we've got to solve the problems. We've got climate change. We've got soybean aphids. We've got all sorts of bad things going on. They're threatening our food supply. They're threatening our cities. They're threatening our lives and our existence, if you will. And that's why we get up in the morning. At the other end, it's like, I wonder why plants are allotetraploids. I just want to know that. I want to know why. And so the why questions, you know, is discovery science. And so in some of this, the futures, this is really why almost everybody gets out of bed in the morning. So what if you don't know whether this, 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 or this is going to be the case? You have to prepare to be able to do this kind of research, the necessity research, if you will. So George talked about spraying insecticides. We don't want to do that. Uh, we want to solve problems like that in a, in a more um, environmentally sensitive way. On the other hand, we've got to be able to do a basic discovery. And that's why BTI was formed, really, was to discover things about plants. So both of those are skill sets we need to have in the future. We need to be able to work with limited resources, which makes us need to be more nimble, more interdisciplinary, more collaborative. Um, but we also need to play in a, in a world where there's a lot of resources around and we have to differentiate ourselves as BTI. We're not going to succeed if we're just like everybody else. So these are the kind of considerations that come into play when you start to prepare for multiple scenarios. You discover that we need to build in flexibility in our, in our people, flexibility in their training. People have to be responsive. They have to understand the basic biology, but they also have to understand how to apply biology to problems. Therefore, we need good technology transfer, for example. So this was all uh, 
part of what we discussed in strategic planning and what's led, led to the draft BTI strategic plan, which is um, in, uh, uh, been sent out for comment to uh, all the people who uh, participated in that exercise. So let's talk about training now for the, uh, the rest of the time. So first we, we created the scenarios and then there was two workshops. One was about a, a year and a half ago. And this was a, a traditional workshop, if you will. We invited people that we thought represented different kinds of institutions, but mostly faculty. We had a couple of postdocs. And we made, they made uh, four main recommendations, which I'll review. But then we decided to repeat the experiment with a different cohort. And this was the trainee-centric uh, workshop, where the trainees did all the work and the the faculty that were there were there to serve coffee and take notes. And they um, uh, came up with similar recommendations but added two more. And uh, I will again discuss those. Okay, so for this is Paul Comet, one of our board members who happened to be at the first workshop. And these are the, I just tried to distill the, the principles from the first workshop into these three points. Uh, which I'm calling trainee-centric. So I, I think traditionally training has been a little bit about the trainer. These are my students, these are my postdocs. I'm responsible for them. The kind of paternalistic, if you will, role. Uh, this is kind of turning it around the other way by giving the trainees greater independence, but also greater responsibility and accountability. And then the second principle is that training needs to be, as I mentioned earlier, in the context of scenarios, flexible and, and adaptable. So I, I, I need to customize my program to do and build the skills that I need to, to have for my goals, not just a standard set of goals that everybody shares. We don't train everybody exactly the same way. And also this idea of, 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 um, of supporting decentralized components. And what I mean by decentralized components is that my learning isn't just at Cornell, at BTI and Cornell. It may be uh, decentralized because I may take a MOOC, I may go on an internship, I may go on and do an international experience. And how do I assemble that kind of a program? How do I get credit for all those disparate components and in terms of, of, of all contributing to my, uh, my degree success or my career success? So this T-training mentality to broaden our training while we still learn to do that discovery research by practice. This is why we come to a place like BTI. BTI is known for discoveries. We don't want to lose that. And then the mentoring component, which is really important because these, if you give us a training independence and just say, go create an independent program and carry it out, they don't have the tools. So how do I help a person develop their training environment and maintain it? And how do we maintain that accountability? So the, those were all the principles from the first workshop. And so how do we carry out such a thing? How do you, how do you, uh, how do you implement uh, that kind of a program? And one of them to create its independence is directly funding trainees. So we really advocate for giving money directly to trainees instead of having it filtered through grants in many cases. And I know at least Bio and NSF is very interested in doing that. And faculty are a little bit resistant to that because they see their grants are going to shrink, they're going to lose control. But on the other hand, the trainees, right, they're taking their lives, they're coming in to do training. Um, maybe they should actually be able to walk and decide what group and what environment they want to join. If they have the money, they can do it. And we could argue about this all day. I'm just talking about some of the, some of the embedded uh, principles in there, if we direct each other. And then, um, in order to customize training, what about an individual development plan? So this is a responsibility of a trainee and their mentors to maintain and develop. So we can't just give a trainee money uh, because they wrote a proposal and then let them go for three or four years and then see what happens. They should be following a plan, and that's part of the accountability. And the credentialing system I mentioned is for these non-traditional components. So if, if I need a certain amount of credits in order to graduate, for example, and I go off and do an international experience and an internship for a year and I get zero credits, is that just going to extend my time at my institution? That isn't fair. And we want to make sure that different kinds of experiences can be credentialed as appropriate. So there has to be accountability so that we've heard about for-profit universities where you can learn real estate skills. You can borrow and pay a lot of money and learn absolutely nothing. So how do we monitor these, these alternative experiences made so that they really are conferring skills and then when they are and when the person actually does the work that they get credited for. And there's a, there's a number of systems out there. Some of them are called micro-credentialing, for example, and you can find those. And perhaps they need to be applied to science in some way. 
A new mentoring system is required. This means a mentor, the simplest way to think about it is you have your lab mentor, the regular one, as it were, um, and then you have a second person who's thinking about your career and your individual development plan, um, exclusive of your research program. So they really have the eye on your, your future development. And then, uh, maybe most importantly, how do we change the system? You can't fight the system every step of the way. You have to incentivize uh, colleges, universities, uh, training organizations, research institutes to change. It has to work for both the trainers, the trainees, and the institutions in some way, or the system will, will break down. And some would argue that it's broken right now because the different components of the system have different objectives. Okay, so we decided to repeat the experiment because it was really interesting to see what this faculty group came up with, but it, it felt very top-down, you know, that we were telling the trainees how they ought to want to be trained. And so I went to NSF uh, with uh, Chris and my, uh, Taylor, my co-PI, Natalie, and uh, I don't remember, maybe Vanessa came along, and we said, you know, wouldn't it be interesting to get a group of trainees in a room and see what they would do? And they said, yeah, here's some money, why don't you go do that? So we had just spent it by the end of September, and it was like August, so it was kind of a rush. Um, to, to get it done. But Natalie ran a, a uh, application process for uh, people to join. And I remember telling several people <coughs> here about that. And unfortunately, nobody from BTA or Cornell applied to come to the workshop. But we had a really interesting group of people from other parts of the country. And this is the breakdown of the participants, so about three quarters graduate students. Um, a lot of the rest were postdocs, but we had some, if you will, non traditional participants as well. And um, this was a kind of a peer-to-peer -peer exercise. So bring in uh, the people to talk and work with each other to think about the future. And I call it a blind tasting because we didn't tell them what the first workshop had come out with until the second day. So they had gone through all of their work, the main part of their work. And then at that point, on the second day, they were able to compare their findings with the findings of the first workshop group. And they were pleased to find out, first, that they didn't have completely opposite results, but second, that the trainees had something very substantial to add. To the next slide. And then, um, because the trainees were doing so well with the facilitator, and you see Susan Stickler here, she, she uh, decided to do something called open space. And open space is a, an exercise where, if you have an idea, you go stand somewhere, and you look and see if anybody wants to stand with you. You hold up your little sign that you're interested in a new app or something. And there was about 14 students all standing there, you know, with their signs. And eventually they formed seven groups. And they came out with seven pilot projects, which are on Plant A if you happen to be a member there. And so we ended up with a workshop, just not only with recommendations, but with pilot projects. And they had a lot of fun. This is a genuine laugh. Bethany, who I laughs a lot. And, um, and they were really listening to each other. So the, the grown-ups, if, if the adults, are, they're all adults, they, the senior people, like me, the old people, we were, uh, we were really uh, wallpaper, and it was a, a super enjoyable experience to just watch how the energy in that room was unbelievable. Like, you young people take it for granted, but you're incredibly energetic, and it was just, it gave me some hope for the future. Like, being around young people is something you should do if you're ever feeling downtrodden, kind of like another year, BTI, you know, what, what am I here for? So. If you think about being here for the younger generation, then it always brings, brings some energy back, at least temporarily. So it was, uh, it was really wonderful to be around uh, all those young folks and to see how productive they could be. <coughs> and so these are the additional recommendations that the, uh, the <coughs> came up with. One was dual accountability. This is really interesting because the, the faculty-driven group would say, well, if they're going to get the money, if they're going to make a plan, they better do what they say they're going to do. And then the younger people said, hey, well, that's fine, that's fair, but what about the mentors? What if they're not doing their job? What if the faculty advisor isn't doing their job? Isn't there any accountability? And you know, in the tenure world, sometimes there isn't a lot of accountability. So this idea of dual accountability, I think was a good catch on their part. And again, this comes back to incentivizing institutional change. If an institution won't hold their faculty accountable, trainees aren't gonna hold them accountable either, but if they have the money, they can go to the labs where they are getting the right training. And that, that's kind of a backup system, if you will, for a lack of accountability. So if some people don't train very well, why should they get students? Not just because they have a grant, they should, they should, they should do their job. Now, the other one that I thought was a great catch was this idea of promoting well-being and work-life balance. So the faculty 
uh, dominated group never uh, talked about that. Like quality of life, like is it any fun, you know? Can I actually have a life? Um, didn't really come up. <laughs> and maybe because by the time you become a faculty member, you've given up on, on, on that, at least for some period of time. And we kind of tend to laugh about that. We, you see a lot of gallows humor if you look at you know, postdoc uh, publications and cartoons. But in real life, like reality of it is that if all we can do is just kind of have gallows humor, we don't have a great career uh, going for us. So this idea of well-being and work-life balance uh, is actually quite important. Why? Because especially in these scenarios where there's a lot of resources for science, we're actually going to need scientists. And if nobody wants to be a scientist because it looks like a treadmill or a hamster wheel or whatever, um, you know, we're doing something wrong. We're going to lose people, and we are losing people, to many other careers. It's, yeah, you know, I don't mean that people should work three hours a day and kick back, um, you know, but hard work and, and vacation actually can coexist and should coexist, and I believe that is absolutely the case for BTI as well. So bringing forward this principle of well-being, and incidentally, Cornell just today came out with a work-life balance survey that they did. Um, makes for interesting reading. Um, so uh, you can take a look at the results of, of that and think about work-life balance. What does it mean to them when, as they put out the survey? What does it mean to you? And how do we balance our, our feeling that every minute we spend out of the lab is, is one less chance for us to have a good job? versus the refreshment that it really gives us to take some time off to clear our minds. Um, and uh, and I, I believe that everybody should have that balance and the ability to have that balance. And yes, there'll be periods of your life where you have to push. But if you just push all the time, it's just a recipe for burnout. And then people will go off to other careers besides plant science. And we need plant science. It's important. OK. And then the other uh, area that the trainees really emphasize was science communication. and. I put this cartoon up, uh, can I tell you about science and okay with the hands out, don't tell me about science because scientists are taught science communication as a go tell people what you do, go tell the public why science is important, go tell the federal agencies why they should give us more money, but they're not trained to listen. Think about that. So how do we listen? How do we listen to each other? How do we listen to communities? And, and, and how do we engage with the public, not talk at, but talk with, to discuss, to engage. And this idea that the trainees had was, you know, scientists are walling themselves off with their jargon and with their training that is really designed to have them speak. Yes, use different words with different audiences, but talk at them. It's really about engagement. So a really interesting result from that workshop. So how is this relevant to us? I wanted to talk about the characters of BTI and the things we're doing that, that uh, are kind of in sync with this, this sort of thinking. Um, we had a really great participation in strategic planning, so people from across the institute took an interest in the future and in helping plan for the future. And I feel like BTI, relatively speaking, has an adventurous mentality. Yes, we have some people who are quite conservative, but we have some adventurous people too. And if you look at our new faculty job ad that just went up, I think it's adventurous, yeah, for example. Um, we also have institutional commitment, so we support the, uh, the education and outreach department. We have supported them for a long time. We have a board, a scientific advisory board, that are quite engaged with us in thinking about different ways to do things. Uh, we're supporting the BCDC, which includes this consultancy um, service, which is, I think, broadened a lot of people's understanding of bioinformatics, a really key area to be aware of. Um, we uh, advancement um, gives us many opportunities to engage with the public. People have made videos, they've co-written press releases, and so on. So if you want to get a hand at science communication that's different than the ordinary, keep in company, you're there to help you. <coughs> and we also uh, mentioned earlier this uh, problem solving. We have a really high level of tech transfer support, so that's headed by Paul, and there'll be a new hire there. So and a lot of people are interested. Right now, we have, I think, three startups in different uh, stages, which is uh, certainly a record for BTI, probably three higher than the record. Um, so we're proud of that, entrepreneurialism. And also, um, we allow people to travel to, through the director of research office. Usually, people use it to go to a meeting where they already know a lot of people. But if you wanted to apply to go do something different, to experience something new, don't hesitate to ask for money. <coughs> We also have a background. We have 
great participation in our view of, and opportunities, which does give mentoring chances for postdocs and students. Um, Eric in particular, but also and George, have been uh, <coughs> PI, co-PI in a number of training grant proposals, so the REU uh, proposal has been renewed, I think it's three times now, working on five or four. Oh, that's four fingers. <laughs> it's hard to see from here. <laughs> Uh, Eric is, uh, has uh, been a PI and OPI in three or four of them, I think three maybe by now. I Who lost count? He's lost count. Five, actually. <laughs> so this is this is really great. I like to see the leadership in this organization for uh, people who are, who are thinking about the community and not just about the labs. I mentioned the stars and the informatics training. And also there's the PGS, not last but not least. Uh, you guys, you, the PGS, are positioned to you consider these kinds of recommendations to adapt them as required and to lead. And uh, there's been the mentoring um, opportunities with the alumni, which I think has been seized on by the PGS. They also, the PGS also has a budget. And I'm always pushing the PGS to be more creative with their budgeting, to ask for more for really interesting things. I'll reiterate that, you get a budget every year. Um, you're in a great position to lead. It's a, it's a tricky organization because there's so much turnover, but turnover is also an opportunity. Okay, I want to mention at the end, um, this is one of Eric's, uh, the proposal is still pending, right, Eric? Yeah, so this is an in innovation and graduate education proposal. Um, it has these components that are listed here. I kind of like the graphic. Uh, the main idea is that there's a, uh, a T training course, so there's a professional development workshop that it confers these different sorts of skills, including how to develop an individual development plan. There's also a mentoring system that goes with it. So again, um, yes, a plan, but yes, help in developing and monitoring that plan. And also an academic industry networking conference. So here's the conference. It's in a collaboration with St. Louis University and the Danforth Center. Obviously, it'll be held in St. Louis. So bringing the trainees, some from Cornell, some from other places, and these uh, industry uh, representatives. So what is life in the private sector like? And whether or not this proposal is funded, uh, we're hoping to do this conference and to develop the course. So Delaney's involved in that. Um, again, something to broaden our training and something to take a leadership position at BTI. I encourage you to ask Eric for more details. And also we're keeping our fingers crossed that it gets funded, although it'll be a lot of work uh, if it is. So in closing, I just wanted to throw out some bigger questions for, for people's reflection. So, what do we know about where we are a long time ago? In other words, um, you know, does our, does our culture promote the kind of career development that we need here? And Human Resources at one time gave me some statistics about BTI, where, where people went. It was, you know, with the postdocs, a third of them went to faculty positions, a third went to another postdoc, and a third went to industry, it was something like that. But we actually have very little longitudinal information, meaning information over the years about where people go. So until we know what we're preparing people for, it's pretty hard to know how to prepare them. So we tend to fall back on the things that we already know how to do. And we've had an intern, Vanessa had an intern working on some of that, uh, who's, uh, who's quit, so Delaney's trying to find a successor. <coughs> and also, you know, she was looking at really the career options. Where are the jobs going to be? We hear that everything's going to be taken over by robots, so maybe we need to train plant scientists to program robots and repair them, and only half joking, really, there. You know, and, and so, you know, what is a plant scientist? Is it a nanotechnologist? Is it a physicist? Is it an ecologist? What are, where are the jobs? Where are they going to be? Um, and how do, we, how do we do this broader training without poisoning our traditional academic type training? Because this is really the jewel of the place. If we lose uh, our ability to make discoveries, to turn over new leaves, uh, we've lost the intent of the place. So I certainly wouldn't advocate, uh, advocate abdicating uh, traditional academic and research training to do something else. It's an and, not an or. We think the or makes it richer, but we can't forget uh, why we're here in the first place. And of course, we're at Cornell, and so the, uh, the IGE proposal that I mentioned in the previous slide uh, is an example of a collaboration with Cornell. Um, Cornell always seems to be interested in this stuff. I've talked to deans, associate deans about it. As I mentioned, IP Cal's use the scenarios for their own planning. But you also get a really close-up view of how hard it is to change anything in academia. So SIPS is trying, other parts of Cornell are trying, but it's a turn in a battleship. And we at BTI have an opportunity to do things faster and differently, and I hope we take full advantage of that 
uh, in the future. And that is it. Thank you very much. Any questions for David? I have one quick one. It's sort of the dual mentoring idea. Do you really think it's necessary? That you don't think the one mentor that you have could fulfill that dual role? Um, no. no. <laughs> Maybe the extraordinary one. It's, but, it's like it's, it prevents conflict. Yeah. It's like the, the, your original mentor has his own or her own goals, and then further in their career. And sometimes, you know, you hope that that doesn't interfere with yours, but sometimes it does. So I think that extra mentor would be good to, you know, outside <laughs> the bubble. Yeah, and there's a psychological issue there with, you know, when, when I have a student or a postdoc, I mean, you tend to want things for them, um, but they tend to be the things that you want, and then when they don't want the same thing, there's just kind of problem that arises. <coughs> so I think you're right, uh, different objectives. But they should be, you know, it's a, it's a, you don't want to create a power struggle either. No. So, you know, it's a complicated. Other questions? Okay, if there are any other questions, let's thank both of the speakers.